I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I actually have notes again. I, uh, I promised I would do a sermon series, and so you're getting it. I'm afraid it's a bit content heavy, so um, I, see, I see a number of medical people in the community today. It's, it's an anatomy class, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, oh, oh, no, these things, yes. Uh, we're doing the Anatomy of Sin uh, as my little preaching series in Lent. I've got three sermons in the season of Lent, apart from Holy Week, and so I thought I would go through some of the deadly sins with you um, as, a, uh, as a Lenten exercise, of reflecting on how we commit all of them. Um, and, um, and certainly some of us have certain favorites. So uh, this, it may be news to you that you are a sinner, in which case I pity you. Uh, this may be bad news. The good news is that while our love for God and neighbor may be fragile, God's love for us is not. And so one of the best news of the gospel itself is that while we were yet sinners, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. So it's okay to learn how sinful we are. Now, last, uh, uh, last sermon, which was two weeks ago, I talked about the sins of the heart. Um, which were, let's see if I can remember, pride, deceit, and envy. Uh, this week we are doing sins of the mind, which are, um, this week we're going to do avarice, and fear, and gluttony. And when I say they're sins of the heart or sins of the mind, sins involve all of our beings, but they, they're, they're called that, uh, they're, they're attached to one particular modality of experience, because that's the part that becomes obsessed with the, um, uh, the, the object that creates the behavior. And there's always some idolatry at the heart of every fear. There's something that we put in the place of God. Um, the, 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 the great teaching of Christianity and Judaism is that, that ultimately we must put God as, at the center of our value system. Um, it's the root of the word worship, worth-ship. So the thing of highest worth must always be God. And if we put something besides God in that place of the place of highest worth in ourselves, in our actions and our values, then we commit idolatry and we skew off of the straight path and start behaving in ways that are uh, sinful. So the, the problem with sins is that we do damage to others. We don't want to do that. The solution to sins is to, is to name the idolatry at the root and let go of that thing which is not God to which we are clinging. So part of this anatomy is, for each of these three deadly sins, I'm going to name the idolatry, and I'm going to talk about, hopefully, a holy idea and a practice that is the way to move from the sin to the corresponding virtue. And of course, each sin has a corresponding <coughs> virtue. So with those, um, oh, the last, the last little uh, preface is by naming, whether it's a sin of the heart or the mind or the body, um, because that one function has become captive to the obsession with each of these sins, one of the uh, bits of wisdom about how to get around that is to pay attention to other ways of knowing. So if our brain is spinning on the focus of our greed, for example, I've got to have it, I've got to have it, I've got to have it, listen to the body, listen to the heart, those are more trustworthy because they are not captive to that particular sin. So, there's the preface. On with the fun. Uh, greed, let's talk about greed. There are social manifestations of sin and there are individual manifestations of sin. Greed is the easiest one to talk about in terms of social manifestation. I'm sure each of you could preach a whole sermon on the way greed is manifested in our society. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the whole advertising business of creating needs and desires that don't necessarily exist in order for us to be captive to those needs and desires and need to fulfill them. Um, the, uh, the other conversation that certainly I have been very uh, engaged in since the financial crash of 2008 is the, the social sin of inequality, uh, where the, there's a certain degree of inequality which becomes um, toxic for societies. And how do we get ourselves into this place where, um, uh, where we're back to essentially 18th and 19th century levels of inequality? Um, the other phenomenon in modern culture, oh, another uh, hobby horse of mine, is how the internet exacerbates all these sins um, exponentially. Greed is exacerbated by the internet exponentially in the form, particularly, of scammers. Um, 
that, that the scam, the con artist, always appeals to greed. Um, you know, the, the great two-man violin scam. I've got a violin that's worth $250,000. Of course, it's an ordinary violin. And, um, and the scam is to convince the person to make off with the violin. Meanwhile, uh, they've lost the money that they thought they were spending on a brilliant violin. Uh, the internet has, um, has raised that uh, exponentially. I just got a text two days ago from Bell Mobility telling me that uh, I have a rebate waiting for me. If I just go to this email address, or this uh, web address in the Cayman Islands, I can pick it up. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I can read a web address. Um, but, if, you know, even if I, and, and of course it's an appeal to read, even if I know there's no rebate accruing to me, I just got a notice from Bell saying they're raising my rates by five bucks a month. Um, there's no rebate there. Um, but, hey, if they don't know, then give me a free rebate, sure I'll take it. Soon I've given away my bank information. So greed is everywhere, it's easy to exploit, and it's easy to fall prey to. We all have it. Now, there's another version of greed, uh, which is a more subtle um, manifestation, which is a kind of miserliness, an Ebenezer Scrooge-ness of greed, where it doesn't necessarily take form in an acquisitive obsession so much as a, a need to control what my ownership is and what my responsibilities are. So you can be miserly with your money, with your time, with yourself. Um, and, and you know that you're falling prey to that sin when you have anger, at, uh, when people ask you to do things that you have not agreed to do. Um, and so you file that, how, how dare you? I've told you I've done all this and this for you. If you don't cross this line, this is not okay. And of course, um, relatives do that all the time. Um, where if you have children or parents, they will they will need your help and uh, assistance at times that are not convenient to do to you, and push past those natural boundaries. And so that that need for control is also a form of uh, greed. It's a miserliness, and there's no amount of control that can satisfy uh, that that uh, that need. So the idol that is at the heart of greed is the need for control. It's not that you want experiences when you're greedy, you want to own things. You want to know, you want to have. So whether you're greedy for money or possessions or, uh, or even knowledge, information is a form of greed. It's the, it's the need for control because what is motivating you is the, the fear of being out of control. So you need to own things, you need to have things, so you have control over your life. And that control becomes the idol. Now, the corresponding virtue is generosity. Um, and so how do you move from miserliness to generosity? The holy idea is koinonia, the Greek word for community, sacred community, that we are more complete together than we are individually. The, the, the miserly types, the greedy types, feel fundamentally like an island, that they need to have these things so that they can be secure, so that, that no one can ask anything of them or get beyond those, those walls that are, are their, their security place. But that notion that we are stronger in community, in relationship, is the holy idea that brings us out of that, that need to control. And the practice, of course, is the practice of love. To love somebody means that they're going to get under your skin. They're going to break down those barriers. They're going to get into places that you did not invite them to go. And that is what love is. And it takes you to a better place. We are stronger when we are together in love with all the messiness of that relationship than we are by keeping things neat and tidy and under control. That's greed. Number two, fear. This is not one of Gregory's seven, but I think it belongs on the list. Um, and and uh, it manifests socially, again, easy to see. Fear manifesting socially. We just had that awful uh, shooting in New Zealand that is rooted in fear, and the fear that's manifested again on the internet as, as these little fear memes rocket around social media with a picture and a set of words that the message is be afraid, be very afraid, be angry, do something about it, get involved. And like agreeing, fear can be exploited to, to develop this energy to, uh, to create effects that the exploiters would like to participate in. So fear is very present in political culture. Um, every election, the message is always the same. If you elect the other guy, everything will be terrible. If you 
elect me, everything will be great. And so um, the whole conversation about negative political paths is that what we shouldn't do them, they bring down the tone, they're awful for society, but they work. And so what do you do, right? But this is fear manifesting in uh, our social life. Um, fear manifests in individual life uh, in, in a, an obsessive need for security, which is the idol, um, and, um, and a constant vigilance, which actually can take over to the point where you project onto others things that are not even there. So when you're working out of fear, you, you, you take things um, uh, that are, are the product of your own imagination, of your own fantasies, and your anxieties, and you project them onto others, and you relate to others through the filter of those projections. And ironically, you create enemies where enemies did not previously exist. If you meet someone and you're triggered into responding to them out of defensiveness and self-protectiveness, what they get is all this aggression, aggressive energy. So they have to protect themselves. And if, uh, and if you get two people that are identical in that way, you'll get the Hatfields and the McCoys pretty quickly or the Palestinians and the, the Israelis, or the Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, etc., etc., etc. That fear has a, um, has a, has a way of, of creating the conditions that it's trying to protect against. So it makes your own life more vulnerable, not more safe. The corresponding virtue is courage. And uh, it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, particularly in church life, because we're really good at being nice not good at being brave. So when we need to call out something that's not working for the brothers and sisters in Christ, we will avoid the group of barricade. We will find ways not to say anything. We will be polite. But we will sometimes do that to the point of not confronting things that are in fact toxic. So as a faith community, my, my dearest hope is that we, uh, as Christians and as Anglicans, discover our courage live through those fears and be able to confront them. The holy idea to move from fear to courage is all through the Psalms about the protection of God. Um, the Psalms go again and again and again. If you, if the Lord is fighting for you, what do you have to fear? And so we immerse ourselves in those Psalms precisely to give ourselves encouragement um, and, uh, and, and live through those places where we feel insecure. The practice is, um, of course, a big fan of meditation and prayer. That's very good. Um, the fundamental act in that meditation and prayer is listening. Uh, listening to the self, listening to others, deep listening, listening with curiosity, not listening through the filter of, uh, of anxiety. So we listen, we are assured of God's protection, and we move through our fears into a place of courage. Finally, gluttony. And this is a hard one to talk about in the spring break, and I just got back from Victoria. Um, it was a bit of gluttony, I think. And I'm sorry. Um, the sin of gluttony is pleasure-seeking, thrill-seeking, excitement-seeking, happiness-seeking, where there's no amount that is too much. Um, if some is good, more is better. And as a dear friend of mine liked to say, nothing exceeds like excess. Ha ah. ha. So, so that, that, you know, we, and again, gluttony in our culture, endless examples of gluttony. I mean, back, back in the day, you remember the movie Super Size Me, um, about portion sizes. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing about gluttony, of course, is that it's precisely about addiction, chemical, physical, uh, food addictions. And we are a society of addiction. Um, you can talk about alcohol addiction. Um, just in Victoria, I'm sorry for the aside, um, there was a weird bicycle-like vehicle where about 10 people sit on it, facing a bar in the middle, and they pedal with their feet, and then somebody, the, the paid person, steers at the front and pedals at the front, and they go from pub to pub to pub to pub to pub, through all of the pubs, presumably, in downtown Victoria, so by the end of it, all 10 of them can barely pedal the pubs. Um, and of course, they're not driving, so it's grand fun. Um, and I just took a look at this vehicle, and, I, and all I could think of as I was thinking of my sermon for this Sunday was, well, there's an icon, uh, um, and it, it's, it's startling when you look at it through those lenses. And there's no end to uh, 
uh, icons kind of culture of that. Um, video games uh, are built on the psychology of addiction. And if any of you have tried to get a young person off of a video game in time for dinner, you will understand how powerful that is. Mom, I can't come. I'm just before I have to get my widget because if I, if I stop the game now, I can't get the widget and then I'll go back and I'll have to start all over again. Um, it's built on that little dopamine hit that hits you again and again and you've got to get the next one. You've got to get the next one. The virtue. Oh, the idol. The idol, by the way, the thing to which we attach ourselves that is not God, is pleasure. <coughs> pleasure cannot satisfy. Pleasure ultimately fades. Um, joy is what we really want, but we'll settle for pleasure, so we'll go for it. And we're avoiding pain. That's the other side. That, that I don't know an addict, and I've met many, um, that are not addicts precisely because sobriety forces them to face pains that they would rather not face. So, the virtue of sobriety is counter, counterpoint to what? Um, the idea, the holy idea that gets us from here to there, from gluttony to sobriety, is the idea of the cross itself. The idea that some suffering is redemptive. Not all suffering is bad. In fact, the whole central mystery of our faith is that you have to go through suffering in order to get to the redemption on the other side. So for, for to, to get out of gluttony is to become sober, to face the pain and swear on it, to, uh, to deal with it, to cope with it, whatever you need to do, other than run away from it into mere pleasure or thrill seeking. And the practice, again, is a monastic practice. It's the vow of stability. And uh, when monks join a monastery, they promise to stay in that one location for the rest of their life. They're not going to go on trips looking for enlightenment. They're not going to hop from monastery to monastery looking for a proper habit who's decent, not like this one. Um, and, and so you take a vow to stay where you're put. And the, the principle behind it is that everything you need is right in front of you. You don't need to go anywhere to find it. And so when you're looking for joy, as opposed to thrills, pleasure, and excitement, joy is right in front of you. It's in the relationship you're in. It's in the house you're in. It's in the job you're in. Everywhere that you are has everything that you need in order to find the joy that you need to seek most desperately, which is quite different from this notion of pleasure seeking, thrill seeking. So there you are. You have uh, avarice, fear, and gluttony, obsessions of the mind, and so pay attention to the body and the heart when you find yourself captivated by those things. And remember always that God loves you anyway. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.